Good afternoon. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here today to help kick off our Westside Synagogue Collaborative Lecture Series and uh, to have the honor of introducing our first lecturer. Uh, I say this because uh, for the past seven summers and a number of the winters intermittently as well, I have enjoyed the great gift of learning at the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem. And I go back year after year because there really isn't anything else like the Hartman Institute in the Jewish world. A home for serious scholarship, interactive study, and the building of community across all denominational and ideological boundaries. While the rest of the Jewish world becomes more and more fragmented, the Hartman Institute drills down deeper and deeper to bring us together, both to learn our sacred texts and to explore our sacred values and how we must lift them up in new ways in an ever more challenging religious and political climate. The architect of this extraordinary work, of course, is our presenter today, Rabbi Dr. Daniil Hartman, the president of the Shalom Hartman Institute and the director of its I Engage project, which has brought him into so many of our synagogues already as teacher and conversation shaper. With a PhD in Jewish philosophy from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, a Master of Arts in Political Philosophy from New York University, a Master of Arts in Religion from Temple University, and rabbinic ordination from the Shalom Hartman Institute. Daniil is the founder of some of the most extensive education, training, enrichment programs for scholars and educators and rabbis and religious and lay leaders in Israel and in North America. And in addition to his broad accomplishments as a teacher and a visionary institution builder, he is widely published as an author. Many of you have read his frequent articles in leading journals and news sites throughout Israel and North America. A number of you have likely also encountered Daniil's teachings in his books. He is the author of The Boundaries of Judaism, co-editor of Judaism and the Challenges of Modern Life, co-author of Spheres of Jewish Identity, a model curriculum in Jewish philosophy for secular Israeli high schools, and lead author of Speaking I Engage, creating a new narrative regarding the significance of Israel for Jewish life. His new book, Putting God Second, How to Save Religion from Itself, is scheduled for publication at the end of this year. And while all of this is what has elevated Daniil to a vaunted place of thought leadership in 21st century Jewish life, what has endeared him most to me is his uncommon menschlichkeit. He has opened his home again and again to me and to so many colleagues for Shabbat celebration. He has opened his heart to share his personal story and to hear and to be changed by ours. And while he has enabled us to learn from an inspiring array of outstanding scholars, the one scholar who has always given the most of his time and taught the most of our classes and done the most to establish the discourse that has brought all of us here today is Mori Bechaveri, my teacher and a most precious friend, Rabbi Dr. Daniil Hartman. Hello, good afternoon, and thank you for that beautiful introduction. I was raised that to be Jewish meant, first and foremost, to love the Jewish people. I was raised that Jewish peoplehood comes before Judaism. I was raised that who I am and the way I see myself and the responsibilities that I have in my life are first and foremost to my people. Now, I'm not making this necessarily a, an evaluative statement. It's just descriptive. 
and is descriptive of many Jews of my generation and Jews of older generation. I was raised very early on with a story that my father taught me. When Moses goes up to Mount Sinai to receive the Torah, what was supposed to be the pinnacle of the biblical story, the happy ending. Moses goes up to Mount Sinai and is about to receive the Torah. And as we're going to see in a moment is the case in the Bible, God has God's plans, and in a, and in a little switch, God plans and the Jewish people laugh. Jewish people built a golden calf. And God tells Moses, go down. Leave. In a very, it's a very depressing moment because we were waiting. The biblical story was waiting. God was waiting. History was waiting. It was for this that the Jewish people were taken out of Egypt. And the rabbis interpret this word when God says to Moses, go down. And this is a lesson that my father taught me and, and, and shaped my life very, very deeply. In the words of the rabbis, through their interpretation of the biblical story, through their changing of the biblical story, God says to Moses, go down. I have given you greatness only for the sake of this people. And now that they have sinned, what need do I have of thee? God says, go down, not because I'm giving up. According to the Bible, God says, go down. I've had it with these people. I've had it with their stiff-neckedness, their obnoxiousness. I'm done. Finished. I want to wipe them out. That's not what the rabbis say. The rabbis don't want that story. They say God says to Moses, go down, not because I'm rejecting the people, but because I'm rejecting you, Moses. I'm rejecting you because there is no Judaism for an elite few. This is not a religion where the individual gets to climb the mountain and have a great time with God in the midst of some ecstatic ex spiritual experience. If there is no Jewish people, there is no Judaism. That's what my father taught me. And that teaching has guided much of my life and much of my thinking. And one of the central questions that I, I worry about and I think about, and it's the subject for which we've gathered here today, is who are we? This people that I'm bound to, this people that I'm connected to, this people who I'm stuck with, and we're stuck together, who are, it pays to know, who are we? It's like if I'm, it's like, it's like I'm on a, but sometimes I feel like in the modern era, I'm on a perpetual blind date. It's like, I don't know, I'm like, I'm going, it's like I'm even, it's a blind marriage. I'm married, I already have grandchildren, and I still can't figure out who we are. Who am I married to? Who are we? That's what I'd like to talk about today. And I'd like to talk about two ideas that I've been thinking about now for years, two ideas that I believe are playing themselves out in the story of our people. Who we are, as unprecedented as it is today, we are telling a story, we are living a story, which is working itself out in our people for over 3,000 years. And I'd like to talk about that story. And I'd like to think about it. I'd like to think about some of its characteristics, some of its challenges, and ultimately, what does it mean for Jewishness and Jewish life today? The first part, 
the first essential feature, and you could sort of hear it, or its, its echoes are present in the story that I mentioned beforehand about the golden calf. See, the golden calf wasn't just a moment in the Bible. It is the Bible. The Bible could be summarized more or less, and God spoke to Moses saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, Do A, B, C, or D. And the Jewish people said unto Moses, Speak unto God and say unto him or her, No. <laughs> more or less, you have the Bible. No, I'm not making it a great virtue, and actually the Bible doesn't see the Jewish people's no as a great virtue. God actually got quite upset about it, had temper tantrums, and ultimately exiled us. It's not who we were supposed to be, but it is who we were. We were idolatrous Jews. We were Jews who did anything and everything but Judaism. The first 1,500 years, possibly, of our existence, the first core feature of what it meant to be Jewish, it was a Jewishness without Judaism. Judaism was not dependent on what you believed, or Jewishness was not dependent on what you believed, nor was it dependent on what you did. You inherited Abraham's promise just by virtue of being Abraham's seed. You were born into the family. You were freed from Egypt. Just because you suffered, you didn't have to do anything to earn it. You were brought into the land and given the land of Israel because it was promised to your ancestors, not because it was something that you did something for, and as a result, it was given to you. In the Bible, to be Jewish is to be born Jewish. To be Jewish is to be married to a Jew. And while God commanded, that's not what Jews did. Now in the Bible, this was perceived to be sin. What Jews did was deemed to be negative. Or what Jews did not do was ground for profound anger. But that idea, imagine, 15, close to 1,500 years, maybe more, depends on when you think Abraham lived or Isaac, and I'll leave that part to others. For 1,500 years, we walked through the world with the name B'nai Yisrael, literally the children of Israel. Initially, a family. Ultimately, a tribe, and in its final stage, a nation. United simply by virtue of a myth of shared ethnicity. That's who we were. Now this gave birth to one of the most important ideas in Jewish life. An idea that's shaping every one of us here today and has shaped Jewish discourse for thousands of years. And that is the notion of what I'd like to call ethnic consciousness. In its first stage, ethnic consciousness simply meant that to be Jewish meant to be born, was to be born Jewish. But ethnic consciousness goes far beyond the mere statement of who your mother or father are. Ethnic consciousness at its core, its first big idea, is for Jews to understand that Judaism is first and foremost a modality of being, not a modality of doing. Think about that for a moment. Jewishness is not what you do, it's who you are. 
That's what we inherited from the first 1,500 years of our story. As a result, if Jewishness is who you are, if it's not a modality of doing, it's a modality of being, there are no better and there are no worse Jews. If Jewishness is who I am, I can't stop being Jewish. If God was stuck with me, I'm stuck with me. And I'm stuck with you. Because whether you keep Shabbos or, go, or don't keep Shabbos or eat this or don't eat that or marry this or don't marry that or go to this or belong to this or that shul, if you are Jewish, there's nothing that you could do that stops you from being Jewish. There's nothing better or nothing worse. And in a, and in a story, and in a Jew, and, which I love to tell, about a woman who converts to become an Anglican in order to marry an Anglican man. And then the marriage doesn't work. And she petitions Rabbi Waldenberg in the high court in Jerusalem in the 60s and asks him and says, please, I made a huge mistake. It was a moment of weakness. I didn't really mean it. I was like Clinton, I smoked, but I didn't inhale. I did, I, I, I did it, but it was not who I was. It's not me. Please convert me back to Judaism. And Rabbi Waldenberg refuses to convert her back to Judaism. He refuses, and he says, I cannot accept your petition, because you never left. And a person could no more easily leave Judaism than they cease being the child of their parents. First, Jewishness is a modality of being, and you're not better or worse at your Jewishness by virtue of what you do or don't do. Two, chosenness is unconditional. If it's who I am, then there is no new covenant. There is no New Testament. And it doesn't matter. I could live in the sewer pits of history. God doesn't leave me. The Jewish story doesn't come to an end because, our his because history seems to claim that it has. There's a chutzpah about Jewishness. There's a chutzpah to the notion of chosenness. I'm chosen forever. And that gave us an inner strength, a spirit which was never broken, also a part of ethnic consciousness. Ethnic consciousness places within the heart of Judaism a core principle of tolerance. Tolerance is different from pluralism. Pluralism means you're different from me, and I think you're just as right as I am. Tolerance means I think you're wrong. We tolerate the intolerable. Tolerance means I think you're wrong, but I have to tolerate you, I have to accept you at the table, in my community, as a part of me. Not necessarily because I have a principle of, of the inalienable rights of individuals to give, to give expression to what it is that they believe. No. It's precisely ethnic consciousness which requires of me to accept what you bring to the table. Because I have to accept you. And as a result, I have to tolerate what you stand for. And tolerance and diversity become part of the Jewish story in which very few get pushed outside, if ever. In a community of ethnic consciousness, boundaries are very, very tough, very hard to define. What's the line? And usually there is almost no line, and the only ones who leave 
or the only ones who we kick out are the ones who left already and we say, ah, we didn't want you anyway. You think you left first? Well, you're gone. Thank you. Who were, the door was closed. The person's outside. They're already in another religion and the Jewish people are still debating. Are they still Jewish? <laughs> What's our responsibility to them? And for centuries, our only boundary was if you chose to leave. Ethnic consciousness created a fascinating notion that Jewishness, that Judaism is also what Jews do. Because if you're around the table, you come with your ideas. I don't get, God doesn't get, the rabbis alone don't get to define. What Jews do also shapes Judaism. Because you're as good and complete a Jew by mere, by mere virtue of the fact that you are. Ethnic consciousness created a profound sense of loyalty to the community. I am loyal to those who are. The fellows, the fellow men and women who share with me that core sense of being. And community becomes central central to who we are as Jews. The person is the, who is the heretic is not the person who doesn't believe in God. It's the person who rejects his or her place or connection to the Jewish people. Go back to Pesach, it'll come soon. Who is the evil son? The person who says, what is this worship to you, to you and not to him? And since he has separated himself from the community, he is a heretic on the essence. To be a heretic in our tradition is to, is to break with a community, to break with a fellow tribe with whom you are walking. In the modern consciousness, in the modern context, Ethnic consciousness gave birth to two fascinating ideas, one in Israel and one in North America. Ethnic consciousness in Israel gave birth to the widest and most broad definition of who is a Jew ever put forth in the Jewish community. If in the Bible, ethnic consciousness literally meant ethnicity, In Israel, ethnic consciousness created a community of anybody who would be killed for being Jewish. If Hitler would define you as a Jew, whether you have a Jewish mother, a Jewish father, married to a Jew, converted to Judaism, have one Jewish grandparent, you are Jewish from the perspective of the law of return of the state of Israel. It's a byproduct of ethnic consciousness. It's a sense that now our blood, a shared ethnic heritage, is not defined by your lineage, but whether your blood will be spilt like my blood. And if it will be, you're part of my community. And in North America, over the last 20, 30 years, ethnic consciousness, with its notion that to be Jewish is a modality of being, with the profound sense of tolerance and acceptance, ethnic consciousness has paradoxically undermined ethnicity. And ethnic consciousness has led to a sense of Jewishness which is fundamentally self-defined. If you see yourself as Jewish, if you want to be a part of this community, the Jewish community, by and large, will now accept you as a member of its community. You don't have to be born Jewish. You don't have to convert to Judaism. If you are married to a Jew, and you see yourself as part of this community, by and large, the community is now testing the notion that Jewishness is completely self-defined. And Jewishness as a modality of being 
doesn't even doesn't require any tribal lineage. It just requires standing up, joining us, and saying, Hineni. Israel and North America are taking ethnic consciousness way beyond its ethnic roots to a much larger, accepting, tolerant, embracing Jewish community. That's one idea. An idea that starts, that's born from sin, truly born from sin, but shapes who we are and defines this people and becomes a core feature of what it means to be Jewish and to be part of this people. The idea, not of ethnicity, but of ethnic consciousness. While the Jews are sinning, while the Jews are defined and self-defined as a community of being and not as doing, God begins to have another idea. And that idea is parallel to ethnic consciousness. There's another idea that I want you to think about. And that is the idea of being commanded. Commanded that to be Jewish means to do something. I know the Jewish people said no, but God spoke to Moses saying, speak unto the children of Israel and say something to them. Tell them that to be Jewish means something. Tell them that to be Jewish is an obligation. Tell them to be Jewish is an aspiration. Tell them that to be Jewish means to set for yourself a system of life which should guide you a Torah, a way of walking. While it comes late, first in Exodus 20, after about 70 or so chapters, ultimately the Bible has the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments says Judaism is not just an ethnic idea. Judaism is also a way of life. Not just a way of life, but a way of life with profound aspiration. You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Nothing defines the idea of mitzvah more than that. I, God, the creator of the universe, the one who is supposedly radically other than you, I am the model for what and for how you should behave. Be like me. Walk with me. Now it's an initial stage, it was a very sad aspiration. Because God talks and people laugh and it just, they never connected. And Rabbi Akiva says that Shira Shirin, the Song of Songs, is the story of the Jewish people and God. Love which is two lovers who never meet. But even though we never met, even though initially we didn't listen, the idea that Jewishness means something, stands for something. The Jewishness is not simply defined by your birth, it's not simply defined by your origins, but it must be defined by your present, by what you do. Is a second big idea that our tradition challenges us to think about. And that idea gives birth much more than to the idea of mitzvah, but to the idea of a mitzvah consciousness that I want to speak about. What are the features of mitzvah consciousness? Mitzvah consciousness means that chosenness is a mission, not a reward. To be chosen means to be chosen for something, not to be given a gift. It means that you could join Judaism and not simply be born. And in the rabbinic period, conversion enters into our tradition as a result of mitzvah consciousness. Mitzvah consciousness introduces the idea that to be Jewish 
is to be different. And that we're okay with being different. And that when the world walks one way, we don't feel compelled to walk that way. We're willing to be alone. Because mitzvah consciousness says there is a way of life. There are other principles that guide us. And together with being different, the next idea is that we ought to be better. It's part of mitzvah consciousness. The idea that we have to be better, interestingly enough, in the context of Israel, makes Israelis aggravated. Anytime any criti- anybody wants to criticize us, especially when you want to criticize our army. And Israelis have a statement, nobody will teach us ethics. Now I do a lot of lecturing with senior officers in the army and I ask them why. Now it's interesting, it's because part of ourselves, we're better. But the interest, if you're better, you have to earn it. In other words, are you, do you have a mitzvah consciousness by virtue of your ethnicity? <laughs> That's an interesting question. But our self-perception is, of course we are better. Who are you? That's the way I see myself as a Jew. To be a Jew is to walk in the world and to aspire to live by a standard that is higher than others. It's only in our generation, it's only in a post-Holocaust world that the notion of double standards is perceived to be a feature of anti-Semitism. When double standards was a Jewish idea. That was our idea. And now we're getting aggravated when you want us to live by the standards that we ourselves said, that's who we are. Mitzvah consciousness gives birth to the idea that beyond one Jewish people, I need to create communities of meaning. I need to find a synagogue that I want to go to. Not just in a synagogue that I don't want to go to, but a synagogue that I want to go to. A synagogue that gives expression to my ideas of mitzvah. A synagogue where as a community, I could share with others the aspirations that I put on the table. This idea in the modern era, starting in the 19th century, gives birth to the idea of denominations. Denominations in its best sense, not in a negative sense, not as a label, but a denomination as a group of people who sit down and say, what do I, how do I make sense? of this mitzvah consciousness. If Jewishness is not simply an accident of birth, but something that I must embody in my life, what does that mean? And the search for people, like-minded people, who will walk with me, live with me, reaffirm, help me raise my children, create a family, live my individual life in the midst of them, that is all, these denominations are all an expression of mitzvah consciousness. If ethnic consciousness creates a self-evident loyalty to the community, mitzvah consciousness makes loyalty to the community not self-evident. At times, my loyalty to my denomination might be greater. But also, Jewish people is only a value if the Jewish people stand for something of value. And if the Jewish community does not, then loyalty to the community is not a taxation that I have to accept. Mitzvah consciousness also raises questions about loyalty to Israel. Ethnic consciousness makes loyalty to Israel self-evident as I am loyal to all Jews regardless of what they do and regardless of where they are because they are my people. Ethnic consciousness creates a conditional loyalty where I'm not sure. Do we share the same values? 
do I agree with you, do I not agree with you, become central issues. Membership in the community. Why should I be a member of this organization or that institution? Under ethnic consciousness, if it doesn't carry meaning, if it doesn't further the idea that I have to be better, then what do I need these institutions for? And paradoxically, mitzvah consciousness creates denominations and ultimately also creates post-denominational um, sensibilities. Mitzvah consciousness also demands of people. And in the modern context says, if to be Jewish means to be better, then what are the values that I have to embody? And now in our community as a profound expression of mitzvah consciousness, if you ask Jews what's the most important mitzvah, they won't say Shabbat, they won't say Kashrut, they'll say Tikkun Olam. As an expression of mitzvah, they heard the story, God saying, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And Jews stood up and said, what does it mean to be holy? What does it mean to be better? I want to create a community with a mission. I am chosen to fulfill that mission. And that mission is the mission of Tikkun Olam, as a profound expression of this idea. Now, for most of our history, these two ideas coexisted. After the biblical period, after the destruction of the Second Temple, the two ideas merged, and they corrected each other. They fought with each other. They argued with each other. And they created a check and balance which created the Judaism that we know today. Mitzvah consciousness made sure that Jewishness was not simply a race. That to be Jewish wasn't simply to be born Jewish. Mitzvah consciousness says that's not enough. You shall be holy doesn't mean it's more than you're born Jewish. Do something. Be something. And at the same time, ethnic consciousness made sure that mitzvah consciousness didn't create an, el an elitism, did not create too much judgmentalism, did not create too many Jews looking at the other and saying, it's bad enough when they say, I won't eat in your house, but to actually say, I'm a better Jew than you? Mitzvah consciousness and ethnic consciousness together pull in different directions but create a balance of a community bound to each other but never feeling that they are sufficient simply because they are. But at the same time, don't feel that they have to be dissolved when they don't fulfill their mission. Ethnic consciousness, mitzvah consciousness. Ethnic consciousness, mitzvah consciousness. In each one of our souls, the idea goes back and forth and back and forth and shape who we are. If I had to speak about where we are today, where we are in this story, Israel and North America are doing something very, very interesting and I believe also deeply problematic. And with that, I want to conclude. Israel, modern state of Israel, inherited these two ideas and said that instead of them completing each other, complementing each other, living together, I'm going to give each one its own domain. Ethnic consciousness will rule membership in the state of Israel. Mitzvah consciousness will rule Judaism in the state of Israel. So when you come to Israel in Ben-Gurion airport, ethnic consciousness rules. To get into Israel, it's an ethnic conscious society. If you are in need, we will die for you. The Israel Defense Forces sees itself as the Jewish Defense Forces. Israelis will die for a Jew 
even if they don't like them. They will die for you because that's what the state of Israel means. And Ben-Gurion gets up in the Knesset and says the who is a Jew legislation means that Israel doesn't even belong to us Israelis. It belongs to Jews around the world. It's your inheritance. And what her inheritance? If you will be killed for being a Jew, come home. And we will turn our society upside down for you. Come home. And when you come home, we will do everything in our power to make you miserable. <laughs> because once you leave Ben-Gurion Airport, <laughs> ethnic consciousness is over. Here, mitzvah consciousness rules. And under mitzvah consciousness, there's a right way to be Jewish and a wrong way to be Jewish. And in the interesting accident of Israeli society, a coalition of secular Israelis and Orthodox Israelis get together to make sure that the only denomination which rules mitzvah consciousness is Orthodox. And the problem of the State of Israel is that the two don't talk. Is that same idea of who is a Jew should shape what we do in the public sphere. Because if you come as a Jew into the State, I can't just accept that you're here. I have to accept your Judaism here. That Israelis haven't figured out yet. We're creating a society where the two aren't coexisting. They're living in separate domains. And the challenge and the change that we have to bring to Israel is to ensure that the two talk with each other. And that ethnic consciousness also shapes the marketplace, the street, the rabbinates. Marriages, divorces, conversions. You can't have an ethnic consciousness in which you're only tolerant of who's allowed into the state of Israel and not tolerant of the Judaism of the Jews of the state of Israel. That's a small little point that we need to iron out. <laughs> but we're still working on the tunnels and some other issues, so <laughs> we have a little while yet. But in North America, we're doing something very different. Ethnic consciousness and mitzvah consciousness are actually talking with each other. But they're talking in a way that they weren't supposed to talk. They become too similar. They become best friends instead of becoming check and balances. Ethnic consciousness gave rise to one of North America's biggest ideas, one of North America Juda Judaism's biggest ideas, which is a self-evident feature of Jewish life today, and will be so for decades and probably centuries to come, and it might completely redefine the Jewish story. But the future we don't know. And that is the idea that I mentioned beforehand, that Jewishness is self-defined that we have to choose to be Jewish, and we all choose it. And we're accepting of anybody who makes that choice. It's a big idea. It's the first Jewish community to test it out. Why America's testing it out, that's a story. That's another lecture. That's one big idea. Mitzvah consciousness has created a Judaism which is primarily defined through a universal sense of mitzvah. Mitzvah doesn't have particular dimensions to it. It is by and large an embracing of universal values. And when it means, when we say Jews have to be different, Jews have to be better, we have to be better at what the world itself is aspiring for. It's not that our ideals and values are different, it's just we are more committed them, them, to them than you. But ethnic consciousness and mitzvah consciousness aren't correcting each other. They're, they're serving each other and complementing each other. Mitzvah consciousness has to look at ethnic consciousness and say, if Judaism is completely self-defined, are there any conditions? Is there any there there that everybody has to keep? Because if there is no there there, 
What does it mean to even be self-defined as a Jew? Because if there is no there there, what does it mean to be there? So how, if the argument is that to be Jewish is, to be, is a self-defined category, what does it mean to self-define yourself as such? It's one thing to be tolerant. It's another thing to be relativistic. Is there no there? Mitzvah consciousness is supposed to tell the ethnic consciousness, one second, I know you're not a race. Thank God we're embarrassed by that idea. That next generation of Jews, that doesn't, that's, it's pasnished. It just doesn't feel right that that's a part of a race. But now if ethnic consciousness means I'm not part of a race, but I'm just simply self-defined, Mitzvah consciousness has to challenge it and to give it content. Mitzvah consciousness, which is moving Jews to be leaders in some of the most central missions and ideas in the world, ethnic consciousness has to ask itself, if we are a community which simply embodies universal values better than others, is there any sense of collective or particular Jewish identity? Ethnic consciousness has to ask, what are the particular values that you stand for? Not the unique ones, but what are the particular ones? Is there a particular form to being Jewish beyond tikkun olam? Is that enough? If I am the best at tikkun olam, I am the best Jew and therefore, who am I? Has mitzvah consciousness created a Jewish community which is post-national, post-communal? Ethnic consciousness and mitzvah consciousness aren't supposed to get along. They're supposed to make you uncomfortable. But we've become very comfortable with the two. And each one is feeding the other into an ever less, and an ever less defined, less clear, less delineated identity. Synagogue membership cannot be either for an elite few who have a heightened sense of mitzvah consciousness or for masses who join synagogues, federations, JCCs, out of ethnic consciousness. Synagogues and Jewish community institutions have to offer and have to challenge people and have to be frameworks where people could connect to a mitzvah consciousness. Mitzvah consciousness is not simply an idea of doing good in the world. But it's a framework for the unfolding of Jewish values and Jewish ideals throughout our lives, way beyond the idea of tikkun olam in service to a world. Birthright, the most famous Jewish collective enterprise, is fundamentally an ethnic consciousness program. It's a program to introduce a sense of collective identity. But it will never be sufficient because ethnic consciousness is not sufficient. It needs a mitzvah consciousness, not during birthright. In 10 days, you can't give a mitzvah consciousness. If you do, everybody will leave. They leave anyway, but they won't leave happy. But the idea that you're going to solve Jewish identity by giving people a Jewish ethnic identity, that's what birthright does. It needs the second half. We could shout at Jews and call them bad Jews for people's feelings and attitudes towards Israel and shake them and say, don't you have an ethnic consciousness? But they don't. 
The reality is, is that our communities, Israel, who we are, is going to have to find a way to embrace a mitzvah consciousness as well. In Israel, we need to create a public sphere where ethnic consciousness and mitzvah consciousness engage each other and balance each other out. In North America, we have to create a community which is less at peace with itself, less comfortable with itself, one where ethnic consciousness and mitzvah consciousness argue. As I started, I was raised that to be Jewish means to love the Jewish people. To be Jewish means to see yourself as part of the Jewish people. The latest Pew survey, Jews are proud to be Jewish. Jewish identity and Jewish community aren't over. There are prophets of doom. I don't want to be a prophet of doom. I love the Jewish people too much. I'm not allowed to be a prophet, a prophet of doom. Because the idea is inconceivable to me. But as people who have joined together in your shuls and in your communities and in your federation and, and, and throughout this community to think about what does it mean to be Jewish, inside, outside, in between. Good name, Jamie, by the way. challenge and the bracha that I offer you today is that Jewishness and Jewish community is not something that we simply inherit. It's something that we have to work on. We are going to be a great community, but only if we make ourselves uncomfortable. But not uncomfortable by taking one idea to its extreme. Not by getting up and shouting at people and telling them bad, 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 good, good, bad, 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 oh, you're terrible. And then leave town. Or that's my, I, I, I'm, I'm the one, who's the good and who's the bad? No, it's where the two balance each other. Where there's a profound sense of tolerance together with the challenge. There's a profound sense of acceptance together with loving somebody enough to expect something of them. We are studying the idea of Jewish people not because we're studying a historical idea whose idea has passed, but because we're committed to an idea that is who we are. But if it's going to continue to be who we are, we have to make it something great. And we have to take the ideas that we inherited and shake our souls, shake our institutions, challenge ourselves, expect more from ourselves. If we do, then this ethnic mitzvah consciousness people will be alive and well for many years to come. Thank you. That's a, a great idea, but it's not so ethnic of you. <laughs> In other words, I can tell you what we do at the Hartman Institute. We, knelt, we never tell people to pray. 
We don't run services at the Hartman Institute. We give time for prayer. And those who want to pray, pray. Um, many of you know my father died a year and a half ago. I never asked people at the Institute to please make a minion for me, ever. Throughout the year, I never turned to people and said, oh, I have to say Kaddish, and you're at the Institute that my father created. You're my father's student. Could you just make a minion for me so I could say Kaddish? Never did it. Because I never wanted to put somebody in a position of having to be in a minion that they didn't want to be in. I traveled out of the Institute in order to make a minion, in order to find a minion. So your idea is, is beautiful thinking, but it's, and I think it would be great if, these, if this lecture series would start with Mincha and end with Mariv, it depends on the time, for all those who want to start with Mincha and end with Mariv. And it's how you balance it and how you make those who want to daven comfortable and those who don't want to daven comfortable is precisely the balance between ethnic and mitzvah consciousness. Raise your hands. Um, I don't want to comment on it a lot, because um, <laughs> uh, I don't want to get more depressed. No, <laughs> I'm actually in a good mood, a little jet lagged, you know, a little on a few drugs, so it's like nice, legal, legal, everything's fine. Uh, no, no, it's, it's, it's how do you create a community which has a notion of mitzvah consciousness and I'm not saying that the gentleman beforehand has a different one, and I think the idea that he's putting forth is, is very correct. Is that I, let's put something out there. The problem is the boundaries, and I'm not saying yours, but like in Israel, we don't have a clear sense of boundaries. Um, it's if I feel something, you have to do it. Um, that's part of the challenge. And, and, and <laughs> no, it, it, it's like, it, it, maybe that's the way we do mitzvah consciousness with an, ec, with, an, with, with an ethnic awareness. If you're part of my ethnicity, you have to keep my mitzvahs. It's, but it's how do we create a little distance from each other? How do we learn to divide Israel? Divide it not simply between Israelis and Palestinians, and not divide it between state and religion, but divide it between Jew and Jew. And, and create that sense of space, where on the one hand, it's not just Haredi, those who have a strong sense of a mitzvah that they want Israel to do, are aware of the fact that that just simply means that that's the mitzvah that they want to do, but not that others want to do it. And at the same time, how do we get more and more Israelis to want to pray at the wall, so that the women of the wall aren't, isn't primarily a North American phenomenon? So it's like, now, if they don't, now Israel will only change when more Israelis want to be there. But if Israelis say, I don't want to be there in the first place, so why do you want me to fight for your right to be there? You know, it's like, it's like, like why do you want to go there? It's, you're crazy. If that's your instinct, you don't even begin. It's when you say, I, I have something that I want. Then you make demands. And so one is making demands of another who's silent, and the other who's silent and not making demands for themselves. And that's when you have a mitzvah consciousness which isn't corrected by ethnic consciousness. And uh, it'll take time. It'll take time. It's not a political agenda. It's an educational one. And, um, and there has been tr profound progress on this. Israel today, on, the one, on this issue, is far better than it was 20, 30 years ago. But we still, you know, I have now two granddaughters. Just, just to give you a sense of pain. I'm working now on Israel for my granddaughters. It's not for me. It's not for my children. Maybe, God willing, uh, my granddaughters will have an Israel which has a healthier balance. 
I can't see anything. And I apologize, the nature of this is not really a, you, a, you ask, I answer, and there's an assumption that I answered. So I hope that is so. Uh, yes, please. You, you suggested in your remarks tonight that perhaps we're being too universalistic in our tikkun olam efforts. I wondered if you might hint just a little bit tonight, maybe even get it as a subject for some of the subsequent lectures. Where should we be looking to introduce or reintroduce the more particularly Jewish orientation to tikkun olam? What's the right blend of fixing the whole world versus our own um, thank you very much for the question. And the nature of balance is that nobody knows what it is and there's never the right balance. There never is. It's like, you know, we all cook and we put a little more salt. It's, I'm not, I don't have fixed prescriptions. I don't think in those terms. I find that a life in balance is a deeper, more profound life. But what it means to be in balance is a very individual question. I do feel, however, that I know that we're out of balance. I know that we're out of balance. I know that when a Jewish community only stands for tikkun olam, there is no reason to join it. No reason. Particularism is when you have, or a particular identity is when you have a community or an identity which is filled with culture, filled with ideals, filled with language, music, um, um, and nuances which enrich your life. We can't um, tell somebody, love the Jewish people, and therefore they're going to love them. We can't do that. I go back, I remember, it was a long time ago, some of you might have been there um, when I was teaching at the Brandeis Bardeen Institute, I think, oh, I think it was 1986. I was a very, very, very young rabbi at the time. Um, it was one of my most joyful teaching experiences. Um, I was there for six years. And I remember, I think it was the first or second year, someone came up to me and said, uh, that's when I met, where I met Gordon, uh, a friend for life. Um, uh, Gordon Bernard-Cunin. Um, you weren't Bernard-Cunin back then. <laughs> you were just Gordon. The tech. The tech. Um, the schlep, I think you were, actually. It was the schlep, not the tech. Um, um, but uh, um, I remember a student coming up to me and saying, Rabbi Harman, why should I be Jewish? Are you going to teach us why, to be, why I should be Jewish? And I said to them, there's no reason for you to be Jewish. Because I knew that I was being set up. Because <laughs> they said to me, why should... That's what we meant too for the first time. You remember? When you were the artist in residence, I remember. Um, I said, because she was just waiting. She said, why should I be Jewish? If I said, you should be Jewish because Judaism taught the world ethics. The answer would be, well, they learned. <laughs> and if they learned, I don't have to be Jewish because we talk, our Jews, we have, we're not better. I should be Jewish because we're ethical. I could be ethical if I'm not Jewish. Be Jewish because God loves the Jews, what God doesn't love non-Jews. There's no answer to why you should be Jewish. No essential answer. And all I could say to her was, I can there's no reason to be Jewish, but if you want to be Jewish, I can maybe teach as to why being, as to how Jewishness could enrich your life. The same thing with your question and the balance. There's no reason, essential answer. Why should you love Judaism? Why should you love the Jewish people? Why should you want to be a part of the Jewish people? You don't need to be Jewish in order to have meaning. You don't need to be Jewish in order to be loved by God. You don't need to be a part of this people in order to care for the world or in order to do good things. But if this people, if this community, if our synagogues and federations and institutions 
Stand for big and great things. Do great things. Have a, give a life a sense of groundedness, a sense of past, a sense of history. Create a language with which you give expression to your values and your ideals. Then people will want to belong. I can't make an essentialist argument as to why. I could just create something that, make, that makes belonging important. I feel, and I'm not speaking about any of you, and I'm not characterizing, but for, I think we're out of balance a little bit with the universalist dimension. I don't think you could create a particular identity exclusively on a universalist mission. That we are the community which cares about universalism more than anyone else. Ultimately, what someone will say is that I don't need to be there. It's when your universalism is expressed in art and in music. When you have other values besides tikkun olam, tzedakah, shabbat, care, compassion, justice. Now, it's not that we speak a language that nobody understands. It's not that particularism is a different ethic than other people. But it's an ethic of a community, lived by that community, within the community, in the language of that community. Now, what's the exact balance? I don't know. We have, there's, there's, I never, at the Hartman Institute, we never give prescriptions. And I know that's one of the reasons why a lot of people don't like coming to the Hartman Institute. It's very frustrating for people. They want me to give them a prescription. I was just meeting, I meet now with um, grade 12 students. We have two high schools, I meet with them. And one of the students was saying to me, you know, oh, you didn't succeed, you didn't do that, you did this. And I said to him, Oh, like, like what was your, he, he was full of complaints about what we didn't do. And I said to him, I want to remind you of Genesis 1, I think it's verse 26, where God says, let us make man in our image. And everybody just doesn't know what to do, what to do with the us. All of a sudden, one God, why us? Do we believe in idols? Is it angels? I don't know what the answer is. The only answer that I like, because it sort of has a, has a nice twist to it, is that God says that in the creation of humankind, I have a partner. And that partner is not another God, and that's not an angel, and it's not, it's the human being themselves. God says, let us make manage our image, because I'm going to do my part, and you have to do your part. And so the Harvard is, I, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't even think in terms of prescriptions. I, I don't know what Jews should do. I know the questions that I want Jews to ask. And so as you ask that question, and, and I'd be very happy for us to explore it further and to talk about what are the nature of the, of, of the way you do values in a particular context. What does it mean, particularism, within a universal ethic? How do you do that? And what, are the place for that? What, is, what is the place for that particularism? How do we put that particularism back at the center of our conversation also? Not getting rid of tikkun olam, chas v'shalom. I think it's one of the great ideas. Imagine a people who were persecuted by the world for 2,000 years gets up and says, my mission is to serve that world. What a largesse of spirit. It's beautiful. But I don't want people to feel that they say, I have loyalty to people in Africa, and therefore I don't have loyalty to people in Israel. I don't want them to make that either or choice. And at the same time, I don't want people to say, excuse me, I have loyalty to Israel, Africa, Shmafrica. <laughs> I don't want that choice. How to balance it? Each one of us has to ask that question and to come up with that nuance. But I, would, I accept the challenge that a class on what does particularism mean um, is something um, that is uh, very, it would be profoundly important because it's the way you tell the story of particularism that ultimately makes communal identity um, uh, important um, and valuable. I hope that's uh, sufficient for now. Um, any other questions? We'll just take a few more. Thank you. You spoke of your granddaughter. 
books, and I wonder, although you don't deal in prescriptions, I wonder what are your ideas, or what ideas have been discussed at the Harvard Institute for engaging young Jews in this uncomfortable dialogue between ethnic consciousness and mitzvah consciousness? Um. Actually, I just gave a version of this lecture to a bunch of 18-year-olds at Hartman. We said, um, I've been working to make Hartman programs younger and younger. Um, and uh, one of the reasons why is that um, I want, I'm trying to train my, retrain myself and uh, train our faculty to speak to ever younger groups of Jews. Because we had gotten really good at 50, 60, 70, 80, 90-year-olds. <laughs> We, we, we might have had one or two hundred year olds, but we got really good at that. Um, but it's the teen, twenties, thirties, and forties that we were getting a little rusty. And so we've just started a whole range of programs specifically geared to that age group. Um, both unto itself, but also to train us to test our ideas. Um, and uh, um, because what you don't want to do with younger Jews is to say to them, you're successful if you become like me. That's what you do. It just, it's, uh, it's very tempting. And there is a large, there is a very significant portion of Jewish life whose vision of the future is, what do we need to do to make the younger generation just like us? It's like to have a bunch of, like, we're living one perpetual Austin Powers movie where everybody's a mini-me. Like, and, and like, oh, I was like, it's a, it's a, it'll be a great thing. But they're not going to be mini-us. Mini and um, part of what I'm trying to do is to even figure out what I'm saying wrong. What's working and what's not working? How do these categories work and how are they heard by another generation of Jews? Just like, how, does, how is Israel heard by another generation of Jews? How does Jewish community and Jewish institutions heard by another generation of Jews? These questions, the things that I could just, from my experiences, um, now it's true, there is a whole range of people who are um, the, there, there is a whole group of Jews who are, who are defined as the unreachables. I don't know how to reach the unreachables. Um, I don't know how. Um, I'm, I'm, if you're talking about the Hartman Institute, we're not a place which directly reaches the, those who don't show up. Uh, we don't. And I think one of the greatest gifts of birthright is that it's expanding who's at the table. Um, it's the first significant program, expand, reaching the unreachables. And I think it's the only successful program to do that. But it's only the first step. We come in at the second step. Um, for those who are at the table, for those who are change agents. And so we're asking these questions. And uh, I could just tell you that the next generation of Jews who I'm teaching understand these questions. The balance, how they answer it, whether they want mincha or mariv, whether they'll, um, how they'll balance between staka and tikkun olam, whether they'll see tikkun olam as turning their back on the community as some of their grandparents might think, or whether they see tikkun olam as the ultimate expression of love of the Jewish people and loyalty to the Jewish people in Torah. Whether they see criticism of Israel as an act of betrayal or as an act of love, their answers might be different from ours. And so the challenge of teaching the next generation is not, it's not that the Torah we teach is dramatically different but it's an openness to different questions and different conclusions that is challenging. And how do you create an atmosphere, an environment where that's possible? I know the feeling I have um, when we run this program for rabbinic students. Rabbinic students who, by many, were lambasted because they went and did a birthday party in Ramal. So, you know, today everybody's, um, what's the term? They're like, um, I'm blank and I apologize. I, I'm, I just landed this morning, so this is the first time that um, I've lost a word. That's not bad. Um, a witch hunt. We, you know, like we witch hunt people now in, with technology. We search their emails and we look at their Facebook and you had a picture. Where was your picture? You celebrated your birthday 
you know, not a, you know, like we want people to celebrate their birthdays in Yad Vashem. <laughs> I mean paradoxically, because that means that even on their birthdays they're mourning. You, you know what I mean? I don't know that they're celebrating. It's like they're always just the uh, that a rabbi, their angst of Jewish history is always not far from them. It's like, you know, just like you know, we should have when you get married, you break a glass. I want to see you breaking something. I want your mourning all the time. And this one had a chutzpah to go and have a birthday party in Ramah. We're testing them. And I sit and I reach out and I tell them, You're good Jews. I know you love Judaism. I know you love the Jewish people. And you see them melting. And you say to them that your questions don't remove you from the table. We all know, by the way, that you remember I mentioned the Russia at the Haggadah? All of us read the story and it makes us a little uncomfortable. Because he's not really a Russia. <laughs> he didn't do something so bad. So he asked a question. So he asked a question. So we used him in order to make a point. But we, with the younger generations, we have to be very careful not to label them as Russia's, not to label them, not to label their answers as outside of the community. Because the answers they're going to give are going to be different than ours. And the strength of our community is going to be creating a space for them to do so. These are some of the things that we're experimenting on, but it's, it's nothing new. It's, it's just a different, it's, how would I, we really have to be tolerant in a new way. And just like, and, and in many ways, you know, I, I, I've just emerged. My, my last child has just emerged from adolescence. <laughs> it's a good thing. <laughs> She's 24. <laughs> and I consider myself lucky because now they say adolescence is into the late 30s. <laughs> so she's a little inconsistent. She's still adolescent to my wife. <laughs> so we have no ship. But, like it's a, um, but part of living with children is, is you know how, how testing it is and how difficult it is. And sometimes there's, um, now that I'm an old grandfather, you know, you can get, you know, crockety and at, at younger, it's just not. You just have to, you have to breathe in and smile when they, when they bark and shout and realize that what they're doing is what needs to be done. They're trying to find their place in this story. And unless we create that environment, we shouldn't be surprised when they find them, when they say, I don't want to be here. How to develop that art. Um, our community is working very hard at it. I think every one of our rabbis and every one of our institutions knows the problem. And God willing, we should understand that the answer is not by finding an answer, but by finding a framework for their questions. Last question, and then thank you. Would you comment, please, about the phenomenon that has been reported on the last year or two of a woman member of the Knesset who regards herself as from within the secular community, who has been lecturing at the Knesset on what I think we would call religious topics, including recently on the subject of Shemitah, the matter of uh, agricultural. You're, you're referring to Ruth Calderon, yes. um, a, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful person who's part of a new Israel. Um, it's a new Israel. It's, it's an, she herself, she's a perfect example, and, it, and this is a good place to end, that mitzvah consciousness doesn't mean a particular denomination. See, what mitzvah moves from mitzvah to mitzvah consciousness. When it stays at mitzvah, there's one way to be Jewish. Mitzvah consciousness means that Judaism has to have content. Ruth Calderon is part of a new Israel. She helped shape it. She and a whole plethora of other institutions, hers, ours, and other people's, have created an Israel where secular Jews could get up and say, I have a stake at the table. Um, the great challenge we face and the great challenge that Ruth faces, a very close friend of mine, is that how do we make a lot of Ruths? How do we multiply her? Um, the great gift is that now we have a figure like hers in the Knesset. The bad news is that a career in the Knesset is very often very short-lived. Uh, we have elections all the time. Um, and uh, uh, if only, if, uh, if Anyway, she's, she's a remarkable person, but she's an example of how 
you hear a 3,000-year-old story and give it new meaning. Ruth Calderon is a model for how to be Jewish doesn't mean to walk in the footsteps of my forefathers and foremothers. <laughs> to be Jewish means to learn, to hear, and to give it new meaning in my life. Jewish people is going to continue to be an evolving process. And how we, that's why I, I, I didn't speak about a fixed idea. It's about hearing a story. Hearing a story is very different from hearing a code or an A, B, C, and D. Ethnic consciousness, mitzvah consciousness, the balance. I just let them reverberate in your consciousness and come up with a balance that works for you. Because the more you come up with a balance that works for you, Jewish people is not some amorphic something. It's made up by every single one of us. Each one of us asking, each one of us questioning, each one of us hearing a story, and each one of us adding a new chapter to that story. It was a pleasure being with you this afternoon.